This is the Half Cup Podcast, the podcast that feels like you're having a few beers with your buddies. The Half Cup Podcast starts now. Good evening, everybody. This is the Half Cup Podcast, Season 4, Episode 13, Friday, August 6th. At 11.45 in the p.m., I am your host, Christopher Swarthout, a.k.a. Swart the Entertainer. I am here by myself. That's right. Uh, we are knee-deep in the middle of summer, and the boys are out and about. Instead of leaving it hanging, we have Neil Ross, a voiceover actor from Hollywood, California. He literally does the voice of Bone Crusher from Transformers. I know, pretty cool, right? Don't know how we did it? Me either. Now, before we get into it, though, check us out on YouTube at the Half Cut Podcast. Subscribe and click on the bell uh, to get all of our latest content. Also, while you're enjoying the show on Apple Podcasts, take a few seconds, leave us a review and a five-star rating. It helps, you know, it helps people to find us. It just helps in general. So go ahead and do that for us because we do it for you. And uh, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode of the Half Cut Podcast. Thanks for listening. This is Neil Ross. Uh, doing the voice of Bone Crusher, and you're listening to the Half-Assed Podcast. Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good enough. That is awesome. <laughs> that is the only thing I can come up with. Hello there. This is Neil Ross in the voice of Bone Crusher, and you're listening to the Half-Cut Podcast. All right, tonight our guest is veteran Hollywood voice actor, Neil Ross. Uh, he's provided voices in many American cartoons, such as Voltron, G.I. Joe, and Transformers. He has done work in numerous video games, including Mass Effect, Leisure Suit Larry 6 and 7, Wolfenstein, Enemy Territory, and my favorite, Ninja Gaiden. Ross has also provided uh, voice roles, such as radio announcers, for many voices, including Back to the Future 2, Babe, Quiz show and being John Malkovich. Welcome to the show, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Are you in a professional studio down there or is that just your house? Uh it's well, I I pass it off as a professional studio, but it's my house, yeah. Very nice. I like your mic. Oh, thank you. That is the uh, wonderful old workhorse Sure SM five B. That was pretty much the standard in most radio studios in the 80s. Really? Uh, Switch to something else now, but back in the good old days, uh, you were hard pressed to, to, to walk into a radio station and not see one of these. Hmm. Oh, that's okay. interesting. There you that's go. Badass. I don't really use this for a voiceover much. Uh, it's just, uh, it's nice to have because it, it reminds me of some fun times, you know? Yeah, definitely. Nostalgia. Yeah. I'm hearing an, a, an a boot uh, coming down the line. Oh, yeah. Well, so that's, that's the, that's the Canadian those. in us. Yeah. You guys are in Canada? Oh, we yeah. Are. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, I used to be in Canada. Oh, really? Yeah, I was raised uh, in Montreal from uh, the age of about 2 to 12, and then we moved out to California. And I don't recall, maybe they talk different in Quebec. I don't recall ever saying oot and a boot. And God knows the kids at uh, Long at uh, Franklin Junior High in Long Beach uh, would have been quick to point out any uh, discrepancies in one speech pattern, shall we say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, in Montreal, I mean, they have the French, uh, the French thing going on there too, right? So... Maybe some of that's lost in in uh, yeah. language translation. Yeah, yeah. And happy Thanksgiving, by the way. Oh, yeah. that's nice yeah. of you to remember because you. But you've got a different one up there, right? Yeah, ours was about a month ago. Oh. We like to do it before the snow comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do anything before the snow comes. <laughs> Although yeah. I was a kid, I used to love winter. You know, hockey. I mean, what's not to love? You know, the one thing I missed when we moved to California was was playing hockey. There was just no way of no chance of doing that in those days. Not really? Here. No, not down there. No. What about the L.A. Kings? Oh, God, they didn't exist. Oh, okay. I don't think <laughs> ordered the hockey stuff in the newspaper. It was like, you know, you know, we, we got here in the late 50s. 
It was like going to the dark side of the moon, you know. Uh, it, it was a very isolated thing. And uh, now there are some actors, Rob Paulson, you may be familiar with him. He's in Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain. Love it. Mm -hmm. And he's one of a number of people who came down from uh, areas where they played hockey. He's from Detroit. And I guess there's a rink in the valley, and they get get out get out there, and they get out there and play hockey. You know, I kind of <laughs> that, but it didn't. There was no shot at that when I got out. Fifty nine, got a hockey rink? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if I'm in California, the last thing I ever want to do is be in a hockey rink. Like it's anyway, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna. Say there were plenty of other diversions to make up for it, but still. You know, sandy beaches, girls in bikinis, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that stuff. Ho, ho, ho. I say that's quite the, um, looking at your IMDb, that's quite the uh, amount of work. You've been at this for how long now? I actually got started kind of late. I didn't get into the business till the 30s. Uh, prior to that, I, was, I, did a, I had a radio career. And I went from radio to voiceovers. We can cover if you like, or or not. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you transition from radio into voiceover work? I'm assuming it's kind of seamless. Not no, not a not at all. It's um. Well, first of all, you have to find out that the business even exists, mm. because Makes back. In the late 60s, early 70s, nobody, I guarantee you, nobody who wasn't actually in voiceovers had ever heard of voiceovers. Uh, and, and I was an itinerant uh, disc jockey production guy, and production means I was creating commercials and promos in the production studio of whatever radio station I had the misfortune of working for. <laughs> <laughs> and I began to become uh, curious about these people I heard voicing these big national television commercials, the national radio commercials. The people who did the voices for animation, the people who narrated documentaries. And I wondered, who are these people? It turned into a Seinfeld routine. Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> Theory that they were on camera actors making a couple of bucks on the side doing this, which in some cases was probably true. But then in 1970, in the middle of a conversation with a record promoter from Los Angeles in the parking lot of radio station KCBQ in San Diego, he happened to utter the phrase or the expression voiceovers and scarcely daring to, be, to dream. I said, w -w 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 what are voiceovers? Yeah. And he said, oh, you know, commercials, promos, cartoons, voiceovers. I said, uh, you mean you can make a living doing that? He said, make a living? You know, some guy's getting rich doing it. It's a, it's a hell of a, a deal. And I thought, oh my God, this is perfect for me. Because I had always fooled around with accents and little voices, little character voices. And I, I was coming to the conclusion that I was really only using about 40% of my capacity in radio. And that I thought, if there's any business in the world where I could get close to 100% of what I have to offer, it would have to be voiceovers. I must get in this business. But it took me another eight years to do anything about it because in those days it only existed in New York and Los Angeles. And uh, really the animation part was almost 100% in Los Angeles. So I had to be in Los Angeles. How is one going to support oneself in Los Angeles while trying to break into this business, uh, I would have to have a radio job. So I was trying to get a radio job in LA and it was tough. But I finally landed one in 78 and that's when I started making the agents, uh, going to workshops, all the stuff that you have to do to get rolling. And it took me about five, four to five years. But at the end of that time, I was making twice as much money outside the building as inside the building. And radio was becoming a, a, an inconvenience. Mm. And uh, so in, in uh, 1985, I just uh, ha handed in my resignation and went totally freelance, which was a really scary moment because up until that point, I'd been a salaried guy my entire life. And now, you know, you, if the phone doesn't ring, uh, you have a problem. But fortunately, 
I did I did really well for a long time. I was very very fortunate. So that, that that's that in a nutshell that's how I did it. But it was it was a tough it was a tough thing to do. It's always been a tough thing to do. But for different reasons, the business has changed completely since then. But back then, voiceovers was this well-kept secret, this little tiny niche in show business, and a relative handful of people did it. And the buyers loved them and used them over and over and over again, and they had no reason to pick a newbie. I'll go with so-and-so. He's reliable. He shows up on time. The, the Clients love him. Why? Why should I take a chance on this kid? Kid, I was thirty-eight. But in those <laughs> in those days, most of the big heavy hitters were guys in their in their sixties and seventies. You know, they would call me kid. Hey, kid, how's it going? You know, I'm thirty-eight <laughs> years old. But this, <laughs> I was a kid, and so you just had to keep showing up and waiting for your turn. And uh, little by little, I weaseled my way in, and uh, that's. That's kind of how it happened. Now, were, were you working with like Warner Brothers or uh, who did you mostly work for back then? Oh, anybody that would hire me. My, the, the, the first out and out voiceover job I did, uh, the first success I had was uh, narrating uh, what they called non broadcast industrials. These were like video presentations for sales teams uh kept them up you know we're gonna go out there and do this and that and the other thing or in some cases it would be your benefits as an employee of foonman industries and sometimes <laughs> the to, corporate the corporate videos yeah they stick him in a in a conference room and here watch this you know and he's asleep <laughs> in you know like 30 seconds but i have to stay awake and read this whole thing <laughs> but I, I had some early success in that i think largely because of my years in radio where i would do what we called rip and read newscasts in other words, you would be at some little station too cheap to hire a news person. So you'd throw a record on and run down the hall and rip a five minute newscast off the wire and run back in the studio. And all you'd have time to do would be to scan it real fast to make sure there weren't any typos that were going to screw you up. And then it's news time. And the news would be as big a shock to me as it was the audience because I had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but develop this sound of authority to where it sounded as though I have not only written this, I've researched it, I'm thorough. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to impart this wonderful information to you. And I was able to use that vocal attitude with a certain amount of success in these non-broadcast industrials. That was the first work I got. But uh, th then I, st I started to break in an animation and uh, some of the early successes, oh gosh. You know, it's funny, I didn't pay that much attention to who the companies, the big people like Warner Brothers and whatnot, they weren't doing that much animation in those days. It was smaller, probably the biggest animation house at the time was Hanna-Barbera. Oh, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. I, I went, the first time I worked there, I thought I've really cracked the big time now. I mean, I got, they had a guard at the gate and I gave him my, <laughs> he actually let me in and I thought, you're right. <laughs> You know, show business and and there were companies uh, you know marvel and ruby spears and what were some of the others and uh, sunbow of course gi joe and transformers Th those were the the kind of folks i worked with now you did a voice in transformers would it be anything that we would recognize or are you just kind of like a transitional guy no, I I had uh, basically four characters that I played: Hook Slag, Bone Crusher, and Springer. I don't know if you guys ever watched uh, the show, but a lot of it. Yeah, <laughs> Bone Bone Crusher is my favorite. So well, it's been many years, but Hook was this. Uh, he was a construction vehicle, and he was very haughty. And this basically <laughs> is my impression of Frank Welker's impression of uh, Gregory Peck. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then slag was down here like this as i recall and bone crusher was up here in this neck of the woods oh. and then um, uh, springer he was just the straight ahead uh hero type you know 
Everybody, two or two of you go around the back. The rest of you come with me. Charge! You know. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, there'll be a lot of people uh, listening to this that are like, holy shit, that's that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are that guy. A, lot, a, lot of, a lot of 80s kids and be listening to this. No problem. No doubt. Now, how did you go? How did you go from that to like covering Viet the Vietnam War? Well, I didn't go from that to Vietnam. <laughs> so there's a bit of a good try. Time travel. Oh, okay, uh, forget I said that. We'll just go with something else. <laughs> Aunt Pat, jump in. <laughs> oh no, you're doing great. You're doing yeah. great. <laughs> you know, had I had a time machine, I could have done it. No, that happened before I came to Los Angeles. That was when I had uh, when I was uh, when I joined the military which I did uh, in order to cleverly beat the draft. Uh, I, I, the idea of bone spurs didn't occur to me at that time. In fact, yeah. I never heard of them. <laughs> otherwise. So I ended up joining the Navy instead, and I was lucky enough to be turned into a Navy journalist. And these are people who are sort of like, they're in the Navy, but they sort of do public relations for the Navy. And I ended up uh, being sent to Vietnam just for a short time. It was a month and a half. But during the time that I was there, there was this terrible disaster. Uh, the carrier Forrestal, uh, an explosion and fire happened. It wasn't a combat situation. Something something sparked something, and it, but it was just terrible. Uh, I think over 100 sailors were killed, and the, the ship was crippled, obviously, and... Um, I just happened to be in Saigon when that happened, and so uh, we fed out the first uh, reports on that from the Saigon Public Affairs Office, and uh, some I, I was told some of the stuff I did ended up on the networks. Did, do you find that um, there's almost a camaraderie between, uh, especially at the time when you started, did you find there was almost a camaraderie between all the voiceover actors? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There weren't that many of us at that right. point. And you ran into a lot of the same people over and over again. And I've always said, and it's absolutely true. In fact, I put it in my book, which we're going to talk about at some point. Yep. I, I've never met a nicer bunch of people than the voiceover community. My God, they're so uh, friendly and warm and welcoming. At least they were back then. I mean, I, I don't get around as much these days because I do a lot of work from my home studio and I don't run into that much that many people. But back then, God, what wonderful people they they would help each other, welcome each other. There was no none of this petty jealousy or the kinds of things that I hear go on in the on-camera world. It just didn't exist. And, I, you know, once in a while an on-camera person would stumble into our world. And I remember one guy saying to me, I can't believe how generous you people are with each other. You just tell, he said, you know, you go to an on-camera audition and guys are trying to psych each other out and they're glaring at each other. And I said, I, I, I don't know your world, but in, in this world... Uh, it's no big deal. Jobs are like buses. You miss this one, there's another one coming in half an hour. You know, <laughs> if we don't take it that seriously, and we didn't. And as I said, there's looking back, there's maybe one and a half people I sort of didn't like back then, but everybody else was just absolutely lovely, and I'm I, they're the the nicest people you'd ever meet. Oh, that's great. So uh, I'm assuming as time has gone on, this this kind of gem that you had uncovered um at that time I'm, I'm guessing that it's become much bigger now and there's a lot more people competing for these jobs oh that's an understatement what i what i wrote in the book is that there was a guy named uh, bob lloyd who started a company that still exists it's called the voice caster he was the first person to open a casting service that only cast voiceovers uh mm. prior to that time no such business existed and somewhere around somewhere around 1980, I was talking to him, and I don't know how it came up, but he his opinion was there were maybe five, six hundred people in L.A. doing voiceovers more or less full time. Uh, when I wrote the book, I called a woman named uh, Kathy Kalmanson, who is with a company called Kalmanson and Kalmanson, and they cast voices. And uh, I was talking to her about what Bob had said way back when, and she laughed and she said, let me tell you something. I 
have a list on my computer of A performers, you know, then there's the B performers, C, et cetera, et cetera. But she says, just talking about the A people, the best of the best. She says, you want to take a guess how many names are in there? I said, oh, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. She said, well, it's somewhere north of 30,000. Oh. That, that tells you how it's changed and why it now yeah. it, it's just so incredibly competitive. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. <laughs> so we'll, we'll jump right into this next question. We were talking about your book, and it's called Voice Recall, A Life in Radio and Voiceovers. Now, do you want to give us a brief synopsis about that? We kind of went into that in the couple previous answers that you've given. but You are slightly off uh, podcast breath. Uh, the title is actually Vocal Recall. Well, it's just basically my life. Uh, I leave out the personal stuff because uh, I don't want to bore anybody. Uh, you know, <laughs> if I put the personal stuff in, it would be a great sleeping aid. But it's just my life career-wise, how, you know, you, I go from being a kid who huddled up in his room alone uh, with a radio and tried to reproduce a lot of the voices and the accents that I heard. And my father thought I was a mental case. <laughs> And I, maybe I am, but it, I, I somehow cleverly turned it into a, a, a profession and did rather well at it. And how I, how I discovered radio and how I got into radio and some of the adventures I had in radio. And then I described the transition, the hard, hard transition into voiceovers. You know, I, I hit town. I had 17 years in the business, radio business. And I managed to get an appointment with a voiceover agent, and I played him my demos, and he liked my animation demo. He was quite enthusiastic about that. But then he played my announcer, my spokesman reel, and he listened to about 30 seconds of it, snapped it off, glared at me, and then said in the same tone of voice you would use if you said child molester, he <laughs> said, you sound like a goddamn radio announcer. And I'm sitting there going, well, big deal. That's what I am, you know. Uh, well, what's the problem? And he tried to explain it to me, and I, it took me a long time to grasp it and a lot longer to do anything about it. The problem was, in all the years of radio, I had learned some really bad habits. I was really good at reading commercials live. I never made a mistake, but I also had developed what uh, the late great Dawes Butler, a renowned uh, animation actor, described as the cosmetic read. It's very slick. It's very professional. It sounds just like a goddamn radio announcer, but it's not in any way persuasive. <laughs> Start to do this, the audience, either consciously or subconsciously, says, oh boy, a commercial. And yeah. Yeah. physically tune out they mentally tune out and the people who produce the big time radio and television commercials know this so they don't want that the last thing they want is a radio announcer what they want is someone who sounds and here it changes you know it's like i call it the invisible dartboard but basically someone who sounds like a trusted friend or a fun friend or a parent or, or a child talking to an older parent. I mean, there's, they want you to sound real, as real as you can sound reading some of this commercial copy, which you know, it's, it's, it's hard to make it sound like it's being spoken, like it's coming off the top of your head, like you're a real person, because some of this retail writing they do is so stilted. But it's something that you have to learn how to do. And uh, that I began to learn how to be a little bit of an actor. We would, uh, I went to one workshop run by a wonderful guy, named Ryan, Hume, and he w w instructed us as we were, take the point of view, you're talking to your neighbor across the fence and you're telling him something important that he needs to hear. Uh, picture the yard, picture the plants, Picture the fence. What kind of wood is it made out of? You know, wow. but these, these are all actor tricks. I just read an interview with Hugh Grant where he talked about how he prepares for a role and he, he, he just, he creates all sorts of stuff about his character. He basically writes a whole 
biography of his character that isn't covered at all in the script that he's working on. But the more he does that, the more real the character becomes to him. And now he's able to convey that reality to the audience. It's kind of this way with, with commercials. I, I likened them to little monologues from a play. But you don't get to read the play to figure out why this monologue. So you have to invent the reason for you doing this monologue. It's, it's a whole process, and I talk about it in the book. But it, it caused me to completely change from that guy with his hand cupped over his ear, a la Gary Owens, into sounding, <laughs> hopefully, like a, a real person. At least intermittently. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start getting into all this? Like, when, when did you meet with this guy that was saying this? To well, you? one thing led to another. The guy that accused me of being a radio announcer, uh, as just as I was leaving, he said, uh, "You know, uh, there's a guy who does a workshop, and he's really great at this kind of stuff. Maybe if you went there for a while, I might sign you." And I said, okay, what's his name? And I'm, I'm smelling a ripoff, you know. And uh, he gives me the name and the number. And I said, how much is it? Uh, he said, it's 10 bucks a session. And I thought, well, 10 bucks. I mean, how big of a ripoff could this be? And so I, I showed up one Saturday morning. And that's, uh, thank God I did. Because, you know, then, see, that was the thing. Driving home after this meeting, I'm, I'm flip-flopping on the freeway in my mind, not in the car. And I, one minute I'm thinking, I am a 17-year veteran of radio. I'm in a major Los An market, Los Angeles, California. What does this dummy know? And then <laughs> got two seconds later, I'm thinking, come on, come on, get real. You got to humble yourself. You got to become a beginner again. You got this is a different business. You got to learn it from scratch. And I finally talked myself into going to the workshop, and I'm very glad I did. It wasn't the only workshop I did, but that was the beginning of the transition. But that's best pretty. 10 bucks you ever spent. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Brian, by the way, uh, Brian Cummings, he is still around. He's still doing classes. Wow. And he's one of the people that I would highly recommend if somebody has aspirations in that neck of the woods. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Fuck yeah. So while we're talking about money in your pocket, in your book, you explain how you survive in New York City with only like $38 in your pocket. Yeah. Uh, you remember that story well, so why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> yeah, I got this job at uh, this place where they they didn't make women's hats, but they sold the material that they were made out of, and they would cut uh, the material into whatever pattern the buyer wanted. And then it was my job to schlep through the streets of New York and deliver these things. And that is, that's what they paid. This was 1962. And uh, they paid 3806 a week after taxes. And uh, I got it in an envelope. It was uh, three tens, a five, three singles. And I swear to God, say 3806, six cents. In, you know, a nickel and a penny. Right down to the penny. Yeah, in a little envelope. Never got paid that way since. The one and only time in my life. And uh, 3806 did not go very far in New York City. So I had to become an expert on cheap eats. Mm -hmm. I didn't have access to a kitchen or anything. So I found this one place where they'd sell you a steak and a piece of uh, uh, French bread for a buck 19. And they tried to get you to buy desserts and all the, you know, the side dishes. That's where they made their money. So I would go down the thing. Or, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And I would eat my steak and my little piece of bread. And then I found a place called Horn and Hard Art. Those were the automated restaurants where you put money in and open a little door and you take your piece <laughs> of pie out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they picked nice. a vending machine. The whole restaurant is a vending machine. Cool. Yeah. Uh, there was a way that you could uh, <laughs> you could eat for a nickel. You would you would buy a roll and butter. That was a nickel. And then what what, what did we do? Uh, oh, I know. Yeah. So you would go to where they made the tea, and you would get a big uh, cup of hot water, but you wouldn't put any tea in it. And then you, when you got back to the table, you'd pour a bunch of ketchup in there and stir it around. Now you've got tomato juice, <laughs> and you know, and there were. Wow. 
there was one other thing. It's in the book. And, you know, if they caught you doing it, they'd throw you out. You, you know, you could sort of have something to eat for a nickel. <laughs> but eventually, I thought this is, I, just, I was losing weight. I was, uh, you know, I was uh, in high school, I was around 143. And I, one, one weekend, I'm walking around uh, Times Square and I've got exactly two cents to my name. And there was a, one of those, they used to have these things, a weighing machine where you put money in and you could weigh yourself. I don't know why the hell people did that, but they did. And so this thing was two cents. So I put two cents in and I weighed 129 with my clothes on. Oh, I said, I, I got to do something. So I went to work for Horn and Hard Art. I had done uh, restaurant work in California and they have to feed you. In California, they did, and I made inquiries, and they said, yeah, same in New York, you know. If you work an eight-hour shift, you get two meals. That's a- Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> up. I'm going to get to 135 in no time. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, my only problem was weekends, because I didn't work on the weekends, but I, I somehow managed to fake something. There so that was life in New York on 3806. I always wanted to go back and experience New York with money. Somehow, there's never enough money, really, for New York, I don't think. Well, you never, you never know. <laughs> yeah. when, did you, uh, when did you really start, uh, you know, full-time, getting after it type work in, uh, on the West Coast, L.A.? Uh, that, would About- have, that was uh, at the point when I quit radio. That was 85. But I was really starting yeah. to roll in 84. I had a couple of network cartoon shows. I had a couple of national uh, commercials on the air. And it was really, people were really nice. I don't think they'd put up with it today. Because they, they, the station had me on the air from 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. So I was really only available from 3 in the afternoon on. And some people would make room for me. So, okay, if that's when he's available, okay. Have them come over, bless their hearts. And uh, but I, I be, you know, I began to see the. Well, then they moved me to weekends, and then I just got fed up with the whole thing. And uh, I came home in a foul mood uh, one weekend and uh, yelled at my wife, and she said, "Was there a problem at work?" <laughs> yeah, that, this and that, and the other. <laughs> she put the sauce on her. Hey, oh fuck! <laughs> just quit. You don't need those people anymore. And I thought, God, she's right. Yeah, she's right. Sure. They always are. And on Monday morning, typed up a letter of resignation and never looked back. And uh, yeah, I, I, by 85, 86, 87, I, I had some wonderful years. Just amazing. I, 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 I never in a, in, in a million years dreamed that I would be as successful as I was at that time. And, and it really, it lasted, uh, oh gosh, uh, about 25 years. You know, it varied. There were ups and downs. But I, I honestly got to say uh, 25 really solid years. And for someone in show business, that's really unusual. You look at most performers and, and they get hot for five or 10 years and then it sort of dissipates. And to, to, to be as successful as I was for, for 25 years is, is a pretty amazing thing. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful, you know. Yeah. Hey, you know, it just goes to show the power of a comforting voice that people have liked to hear for a long time and that delivers the the, the goods, the meat and potatoes. You know what I mean? For sure. Well, that's, that's lovely of you to say. I hope that was the I, I, I can't explain it uh, with any other thing. I mean, it can't be because they liked me. Lovable. <laughs> 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 well, uh, before we move on any further, uh, like you, we touched on all that stuff. Now, video games must have, you know, kind of came out in the eighties ish. I forget when the first video game system yeah. came out. When did you start doing the voiceovers for like my favorite game is Ninja Gaiden? And then you get into like the Wolfenstein and the Call of Duty stuff. Like that, these guys don't know too much about video games, but. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, you know, games are funny. All right, I don't know officially when that stuff started. <clears throat> All I can tell you is the first game I did was in 1990. Mm-hmm. The game was called uh, Stunt Island. I'm sure you've never heard of it. And <laughs> I, did, I did nine lines, and the director said, you're only doing nine lines because that's all we have room for. 
And this game came oh, out. Yeah. Space-wise, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember walking out of there thinking, well, I don't see much of a future with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, it just took off in leaps and bounds. And I think the, uh, you know, when I worked, I did uh, a couple of the Mass Effect uh, games, and I was the uh, Codex narrator. And nine lines. I mean, I did reams of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And somehow they found room for it. And I remember walking out of there one day, and they had this huge poster for Mass Effect in the studio that had been signed by all the actors who worked on it, and they asked me to sign it, and of course I did, but I'm looking at all these names and I'm thinking, my God, all the stuff they must have recorded and somehow managed to wedge into this, uh, into this game. I mean, it's, it's just astonishing. And uh, I guess it's only gonna get wilder, you know, mm -hmm. the, the tech, technology improves, so will the games. I envision a future where you can actually be in the movie with Tom Cruise or whoever it is. Top some gun. some kind of movie game hybrid where you can be part of the action. Uh, maybe you know a virtual reality. I don't know. Something like that is is my prediction. Fuck. As long as it's not a Scientology game, boys, I think we'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fully on joining in a virtual world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So where can people find your book there, Neil? Well, uh, the best thing to do would be to go to my uh, the website that I created uh, for the book. It's uh, www.neilbook.com. And you can read a few sample chapters. You can buy uh, the paper. It'll take you to the Amazon uh, paperback or Kindle. There's also an audio version available on the website, or if you prefer to do business with Audible, it's on Audible. Just put in a vocal recall, Neil Ross, and uh, I'm sure they will take care of you. So it's uh, neilbook.com or um, uh, Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's on Audible. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show, Neil, and have a great Thanksgiving. Hopefully, we'll uh, keep in touch, and we'll get you on again soon. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. I've enjoyed it. Until next time, stay half-cut. Feels weird saying it by myself. <laughs>